In this video, I'm going to be answering viewers' questions. To hear the answer to your question, don't turn away, because that starts right now. Hey! Howdy! Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. I'm the founder of the Boster Center for Multiple Sclerosis, where we care for families impacted by MS from around the globe. Dwayne asks, can Ocrevus improve symptoms? Hoping it helps with right-sided weakness and foot drop. Dwayne, excellent question. It really speaks to the realistic expectations when taking any disease-modifying therapy. All of these disease-modifying therapies for MS are birth control pills against future events. They don't remove what you've lost. They help prevent new loss. So if you have right-sided weakness and you take a disease-modifying therapy, it's not expected that that right-sided weakness improves actually. It's expected that you don't have new weakness on the left side, God forbid. It's true that some of these highly effective newer medicines have shown increased ability to create improvement. We call that confirmed disability improvement, where your neurological examination actually gets better over time. Good question, thank you. Amber Thomas asks, can MS cause issues with the throat? The answer is yes, Amber. When I think about the throat, I think about two functions, speaking, what you hear me doing right now, and swallowing. <clears throat> And so both of those are controlled by the stem of the brain, the brain stem, and MS can impact the brain stem. And so you can have situations where someone with MS may have some slurred speech, and there's actually different kinds of slurred speech depending on which parts of the brain are affected, believe it or not. And so by listening to the way the human sounds, sometimes we can clarify which parts of the brain may not be functioning normally. Similarly, people can develop problems with swallowing, and this is actually very serious because if you have a swallowing problem, you might put food or drink or saliva even down that front tube, the breathing tube, and not the back tube, and that can cause an aspiration pneumonia. So if you or someone you love is dealing with MS, and if they are having difficulty at the dinner table, if they're sputtering, coughing, choking when eating or drinking, that is something that needs to be brought to the attention of the neurologist, and that person very likely will benefit from seeing a speech pathologist who can do a swallowing study and figure out how much risk there is and figure out what we can do to overcome it. Awesome question. This next comment comes from Julie B who writes, I have emotional incontinence, it's so exhausting, and attacks of tic de la rue, trigeminal neuralgia. And honestly, I have attacks of both at once, it really sucks. And Julie, you're right. Sometimes nature is a little too generous and you can have MS lesions where there's been damage from MS in different locations in your brain and as a result, you can have more than one bad thing. Here's an example where somebody has damage to their frontal cortices and it's causing emotional incontinence or pseudobulbar affect, a very, very frustrating symptom. And they also have trigeminal neuralgia. Now, trigeminal neuralgia is this horrible facial pain that people with MS are more likely to experience. And in some cases, like here with Julie B, you can have both. And as my mentor used to say, sometimes nature is way too generous, Julie. Donna Jor 8 asks, so initially can somebody have MS but pass their neuro exam or does the failure come later in the disease course? So Donna Jor, that's a really good question. Early in the disease process, you're the youngest chronologically you're ever gonna be. So you're gonna get older as time goes on. And early in the disease process, there's the least amount of structural brain damage thus far. And so early on when somebody has an attack, very commonly they bounce back from it. How's that possible? Because the brain and spinal cord rewired. And if it rewires adequately, when we do a neuro exam, we might not pick up any abnormalities. So the short answer to your question is yes, early on in the disease, we may examine someone and they may not have any deficits on their exam. It's also true that as you live life with MS, as years go on, you have an increased risk of an attack and you may not fully recover. You also have a risk of progressing a neurological disability separate from an attack. And in both of those instances, you can accrue deficits on your exam. And so it is possible that you might see someone with a completely normal neuro exam early on in their disease course, and later in the disease course, they may have increased trouble. The reason we do neuro exams in clinic and the reason we do neurological testing is so that we can monitor that and so we can see if there's worsening so that we can try to intervene. Good question. Russ Keeney asks, are there antidepressants that are not SSRI medications? Russ, the answer is yes. So SSRI stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. 
And basically, these class of medicines leave serotonin in the synapse between the two neurons longer so that your body can continue to use it. And that actually helps with depression. But it's not the only class of antidepressant. There's a newer class of medicine called SNRI. And so these medicines help with serotonin and norepinephrine. And there's a bunch of other antidepressants. My favorite antidepressant is an atypical antidepressant. That's bupropion or Wellbutrin, and it works in a different manner, although it does manipulate serotonin. There is a type of doctor that is quite literally a grand wizard at manipulating these antidepressants, and that's a psychiatrist. These guys and gals have expert training in how to manipulate them, and if you have questions about antidepressants or if you're struggling to tolerate an antidepressant, sometimes we call into the team a psychiatrist. These guys are super, super good at that stuff. Thanks for the question. Quick shout out to Ichabod13. Ichabod has been a supporter and a friend on this channel for a long time. And when we opened up the Boster Center for MS, Ichabod sent us this amazing stained glass. This is our logo for the clinic and it's absolutely gorgeous. I literally walk by it every day and it makes me smile. And so Ichabod13, you're awesome. And I wanna say thank you. DS asks, hi doc. Well, hey, yes. If the MRI is normal, is there a need to do the CSF test? And so that's a really good question. When you think about how you diagnose MS, there's really five elements. It's the clinical story, which we call the clinical history. And in that clinical history, we're listening for whether the person has had discrete attacks or whether they've had slow progression. The second thing is their neurological examination. And when we examine them, we are trying to find evidence on exam to support their story. The third thing is the MRIs. And honestly, in the modern era, MRIs are very key in making the diagnosis. I would submit to you that in 2021, if your MRIs are normal, you can't really be diagnosed with MS. I don't think that it's possible. Now, the fourth element is spinal fluid. And to your question, if you have completely normal MRIs and you have positive spinal fluid, that's not gonna be enough to give you a diagnosis. What it will do is it will drive me to want to continue to do serial MRIs for a much longer period of time. And so it's not that it's not helpful, but it's not gonna be diagnostic. Excellent question. By the way, the fifth thing is to prove it's nothing else. And oftentimes we prove that it's nothing else through the MRIs and through laboratories. Hey, do you have a question about MS? Leave it in the comments section below and I'll look forward to answering it on a Q&A video just like this. My name is Aaron Boster and thank you for learning about MS with me. Until my next video or my next live stream, or even better yet, if I get to see you at the Boster Center for Multiple Sclerosis. Until that time, be safe and take care.